This one is for the fathers and all the father figures, stepfathers, grandfathers, godfathers. Whether by blood or by choice, we give voice to our gratitude for the fathers, the heroes, the mentors and anchors, the coaches and counselors, teachers and trainers, the men who shape us and show us the definition of faithful and strong and wise, the fathers always by our side, with us and for us, steady and courageous, ready to inspire and encourage and give us a word of wisdom, a voice of reason in season and out. There is no doubt where their strength comes from, what their hope is set on, who their eyes are fixed on, the fathers, the embodiment of legacy, humility, integrity, needed and necessary, dependable and trustworthy. The fathers, the men who lead and love and believe in us even when we don't. The fathers, the men who nurture and point us toward purpose, almost bigger than life, but always down to earth. The fathers, the men who give guidance, direction, and keep everything in perspective, making room for us to grow. We may never know the prayers, the tears, the sacrifices that fathers make on our behalf, yet still find time to play and laugh and rejoice in the day that the Lord has made. The fathers, the heroes, we honor you today. Right then, all of our dads, please stand all across the auditorium. Come on, men of God. Here they are. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers. Father, I bless these men in Jesus' name. Bless their heritage. Bless their legacy. Give them wisdom for every moment. Give them strength in the midst of weakness. And Lord, when, that, uh, when those things come against them, let them stand for their family. Let them be protectors of their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. Lord, we stand even for future generations vastly removed from us. Let us be the examples that children and young people in the future want to copy. Because we, as fathers, want to be like you. And the more we're like you, the more others will become more like you too. Strengthen every man as we celebrate not only their manhood, but their fatherhood in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's hear it for our dads today. God bless you. We love all of you. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, today, I recognize that uh, fathering and fatherhood can, uh, and, and a day like today, for some, maybe have mixed emotions. It's not everybody's favorite day. I, was, I have a, a, a group of men that I pray with every Sunday morning before the first service. And we were talking about, I kind of mentioned how in the prison system, uh, on Mother's Day, when it comes time to send mother a card, they cannot keep enough cards in stock for the prisoners to send a note to mum. And so they thought, well, we better be ready because Father's Day is coming. So they stocked up for Father's Day. And when Father's Day rolled around, not one man asked for a card to send to their father. And I recognize that not everyone looks forward to Father's Day uh, just because of history. Now, uh, I realize, too, that on Mother's Day, it's always warm and fuzzy. And somehow on Father's Day, all the dads seem to get a butt kicking. Does anyone notice that? You know, you got to, not here, I'm not talking about here, because we don't do that here, but it seems like, now you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to straighten up with all the mothers. Oh, they're so wonderful, and we're so glad for all the mothers, but the fathers, you know. Well, today's not going to be one of those days, uh, but this is a day I pray for healing for all of us. I realize that some have, have, have had difficult father relationships while others have had good ones. Some knew their fathers well, while others did not. Some, for some, he was present, and with many, uh, he was absent even more. He was sober and clean for many, while addicted and bound to others. And one thing I know for sure, 
no matter how good a man he is or was or was not, no one has ever had a perfect father. And for that matter, nor a perfect mother. And they never, ever, despite their own declarations, ever had one perfect child. <laughs> also, our imperfect fathers were raised by imperfect fathers. And you can look at your life and say, well, I am a reflection of my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. That's just hereditary. That's how we always are. And the scripture says in Matthew 23, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Let me give that a bit more definition. Sure, we have a father and we respect him and call him dad, we call him father. He's saying by this, there is only one perfect father. There's not one father on earth that is perfect, but thank God our father in heaven is perfect. And even though dad had deficiencies, God can come to make up in your life what humanity could not provide, divinity can. Amen? Amen. And so today, um, I, I just want you to be strengthened and empowered by the grace of God. Psalm 68 says, sing to God, sing praises to his name. He is a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God is a father to the fatherless and he's also a defender of widows. God is faithful to provide what we need. As you well know and is documented by, by continually repeating it, I am 68 years old. But I wore white shoes today and I think I just lost about 10, 15 years. <laughs> I wish it was that easy, right? But I haven't had a dad for 63 years of my life. My dad died when I was five. I've told you he died in the desert of Australia on the way to start a church. But I was raised by an amazing single mother, uh, Ida Amy Turkington, who's my mum, and she stepped in and gave her five children what our father, because of his absence by death, could not provide. God was also so faithful to put into my life significant men because even though it's maybe Father's Day, I recognize where a father is not present, it behooves a mother to step in to provide fatherly leadership when a father is not present. However, what my witness is as well, even though I was raised by a wonderful mother who was old school. You know what I mean by old school? You know, we had two different interpretations of Bible, my mother and I. The, her, her version said, um, spare the rod or you'll end up, if you spare the rod, you will end up spoiling the child. And my interpretation was spare the rod and spoil the child. Uh, so she did not spare the rod. But the rod took on a lot of forms. Basically what was ever in arm's reach was the rod. And it was thrown at us, hurled at us, because she was, had this three-ring circus going on with five kids, and particularly my two older brothers and me, we are very close, uh, we are all two years apart, almost to the day. Paul is February the 1st, Philip's February the 9th, and I'm February the 10th, all two years apart. And we redefined the word Hades in her life. Uh, we made life challenging for mum. My two older siblings were uh, uh, you know, eight years older than Paul and Jim, the oldest, was two years older than my sister. So they were more mature, but we made life very challenging for mum and she had to basically defend herself. And I'll never, one, never forget one day, she was, I made her upset about something. Can you believe the youngest child being so, anyway... And she was chasing me through the house and she stopped and said, will you stand still so I can smack your, you know, on the back of the head? I said, no way, mum. And so we just kept on going through the house and we ended up laughing about it. I'm sure she's still laughing about it in heaven. <laughs> but God was faithful to also put into my life significant men who helped guide my life, who were not trying to replace my father, but God used at seasons and times. 
I was thinking about this this morning, and these are names, some names I haven't thought of for a long time, and the, most of them you've never heard of before, but Ron Stevens, when I was a young man, came along. We used to play trumpets together as, when I was younger. Uh, Pastor Leroy Sherry, Ross Bullard, who was a salty Australian guy who wasn't even saved, and God used him to teach me how to work a job. I was in the hi-fi industry for five years after I got out of school, and I learned about stereos and how to set up, but not only that, how to, how to have a work ethic and how to have an eye for detail, and, and Ross Bullard helped me with that. Tim Ayers, we traveled the country together when I was in Bible college here in the U.S. Pastor Jim Rome, Pastor Mike Hayes, Pastor Frank Holcren, all God used, put into my life significant male figures to help develop me as a man and also as a man of God. And I can look back on any one of these men and remember the lessons taught by them that have helped shape my life. Here's the thing, you may feel like, well, your father was not that effective in your life or he may not have poured into your life exactly what you needed or you may look at your sons and daughters and say, well, I haven't been the, the best father, but God's got a way of making up the deficit for any father because he is the perfect father. He brings into our life exactly what we need at any moment in time. That we don't have to live with guilt and, and be forlorn because we weren't the perfect father. You were never set up to be the perfect father. God's the only perfect father. We do the best we can, but for the rest, we have to say, Lord, these are your kids. Before they were ever mine, they were yours. And that's why whenever our kids were having a challenge, I would use my son, Andrew, because he's in the room. But whenever Andrew was going through something, our prayer to God would often be, Lord, I'm not having a, tro any, a problem with my son. I'm having a problem with your son. <laughs> because he was yours first. And when we dedicated him, we gave him to the Lord and said, he belongs to the Lord. Now, Lord, he's your son. And God worked in his life in ways we could not work in his life. Because your children have also have a perfect father, and that is he who is in heaven. And I, my hat's off to single parents who are doing the best you can. But you're going to have to take a deep breath and exhale real heavy. Because no matter how old your kids are, what stage of life they are, as they launch into life, you are never going to be with them in their ever-living moment. But our Father in heaven will be with them. He will watch over them, he will preserve them, and he will keep them. And as our babies grow into adults, we have to move into another measure of faith. Your, your father may not be alive. He may not be connected to your life or even be interested in you. But in the kingdom of God, you are never fatherless. God was both, excuse me, Jesus was both fully God and fully man at the same time. Truly an amazing thing. Yet in his humanity, he also valued the significant role of his father. And I want to just I talk about two things that Jesus received from his father that really set his life on in course. Obviously, the dichotomy with Jesus, he was both human and divine at the same time. But if you don't understand this next theological term I'm about to use, then you'll be a little confused about Jesus. Because when he was in his earthly role, he put aside his divinity and took on humanity. And we call it quiescent deity. What he did, he didn't stop being God. He just took his divinity and just laid it aside. He laid aside the divinity while also still being divinity. But he didn't operate through his divinity. He operated through hum humanity. How do we know? Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. And Jesus demonstrated the power of God in his humanity. Why? Because if it was only through his divinity, we would never be able to replicate one thing Jesus did. While we have divinity in us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are not divine like Jesus is divine. Jesus was God in a body. However, we also suffer in a positive way, the same condition that Jesus did. How you, being filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, go around doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil because God is with you. 
greater is he that is in you, excuse me while I readjust, than he that is in the world. So Jesus operated in quiescent or quieted deity and operated as a human. And as a human, the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Temptation is not a sin because Jesus was tempted. It's how we respond to sin that makes it sin or not. And in every temptation, there are two things at work. There is opportunity and there is occasion of the flesh. There's another word and it just left me like that, but it's coming back really fast right now in Jesus' name. There's temptation and opportunity. Sometimes in life you find that you may be tempted, but there's no opportunity. Other times there's opportunity, but there's no temptation. We find out the depth of our character is when temptation and opportunity cross paths. And in that moment, we find out what kind of man, what kind of woman we really are. And, and that's where character surges to the top. And Jesus had temptation and he had opportunity. And he did not sin. That's why he is an example for us to elevate our lives to. Amen. So he was both fully God and fully man. And in fact, Jesus was confirmed to be the son of God by his father. And there were two things that his father gave him that helped confirm his sonship. And that was identification and affirmation. Look at this in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. This is identification from God of who Jesus is. That you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, which was an affirmation. There is something powerful about being affirmed by your dad. However, many of us have never heard it. Not from God so much as from your earthly father. And the challenge with the way we assimilate what we receive from an earthly father in our humanness, we have this thing about immediately reflecting that about God's attitude towards us. The influence of dad in our life is so great that we'll just even project his emotions towards us as if that's what God thinks about us. And that's why you need to understand that you have an identity and an affirmation that comes from the Lord that is independent of any opinion that your dad may have, your natural dad may have about you. Because there are, there are three things that every dad needs to have a chance to say to his, his children. And the potential is some of you have heard this from your fathers and others potentially you haven't. And one is, son, daughter, I love you. Secondly, is I'm proud of you. And thirdly, I want what is best in your life. That is an affirmation that every child daughter or son would love to get from their dad that, that while we say, talk about fathers and the impact they may have on sons you may be a father and you've got a gaggle of girls in your household oh well your, the, the strength of your manhood as a father is imperative for the development of your young ladies to become women of God they need an affirmation from their dad just as much as a son needs from his dad because in fact, a father will come and affirm the masculinity of his father and he will come and he will affirm the femininity of his daughters. And you, we live in a world where the identification of masculine and feminine has suddenly got very murky. We have people that don't even know who they are anymore. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. And, they, and all of this is obviously confusion that if you dig back far enough in their life, they never got the affirmation they needed either from anyone of significance in their life to affirm for them who they really are. Because if you don't understand your identity, then respectfully, the affirmation isn't going to do a whole lot of good. You can be affirmed for wrong and you can be affirmed for right. So 
there is, there is something though in the heart of a child that wants to hear these words from their father even later in life. Because you may be saying, well, I haven't been the best dad. You know, I was pretty rough in those days. I wasn't even living for the Lord. And it's a wonder they're all still alive. And yeah, we, get, we all get that. Because no one is a perfect father. Be at peace about that. As good as you've tried, you're still imperfect. I don't mean by that to denigrate anybody. But you have to live with that default. That God is the only perfect father. Therefore, I may have work to do. I may have some catch up to do. But God is going to help me. There are three major ways that living from a place of affirmation can change the life of those around you. Because see, for Jesus, there was an identification and then there was an affirmation in whom I am well pleased. You see, ultimately in all of our hearts, when we get to heaven, we still want to hear those words, don't we? What's the affirmation when we get to heaven we want to hear? Well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. You don't have to wait to heaven to give that kind of affirmation to your children. If you are expecting your children to be as perfect as you have been imperfect, I'm letting that one sit a minute. See, we expect perfection from our children, but we're not willing to give perfection as parents. (laughs) <laughs> but we expect it from our kids. What's the matter with you? I told you once. Yeah, kids have a learning issue. Uh, uh, so someone told me, I, I can't remember, I, I apologize. It, someone either in the church or I, I mentioned something to someone recently and they reflect and they said, Pastor, you said something the other, recently and it had just changed my life. I said, well, I'm always inter- interested to know what is it that I said which I probably borrowed from someone else anyway. And they said, He said, you said that uh, when you're working with your children, when they get about eight or nine years of age, and then when they get about 13, 14 years of age, they have complete memory loss of everything you've ever taught them. (laughs) He says, I cannot believe that because I used to think in my mind, well, I've told you once already, you should remember it the rest of your life. No, kids forget. And this is what can drive them up your last ever living nerve, is to share with them things that you've taught them over and over and over again, and they... Bunk is gone, and you have to start. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Am I, am I in the right church here today? Yeah. And God has to do the same with us. That's why we need His Word. That's why we need a living, vital relationship with the Lord because we have to be reminded of who you are, who we are in Him, and what He thinks about us. Because if you're filtering what he thinks about you through the veil of human flesh, of the examples you had as, as mothers and fathers, then there will be a division. So here's the three things really quickly. Uh, number one, uh, this affirmation gives a very deeply rooted sense of identity. There's an old saying that claims it's not so much about who you are as it's about whose you are. And while that is undoubtedly cliche, it contains a seed of truth. Your identity is rooted in the knowledge that you are loved and are worth loving. That kind of knowledge only comes through experiencing and receiving affirmation from the Lord and for that matter from each other as well. You know, I know that men can be considered the strong silent type and we all understand in communication that isn't always going to fly. Because women, while they are good at a lot of things, reading your mind is not necessarily the biggest gift they have. You didn't have to be quite so vocal, but I understand. (laughs) I tried, and he's right here. Talk to him. (laughs) But we need affirmation from the Lord. There's no because it trans. it, It does something to us. You know, I was thinking about this whole identity thing, and the image that comes to mind is that of a prince a prince obviously is the son of a king listen to this though a prince doesn't really have any resources yet he is he never acts out of scarcity why because his dad is a king a prince doesn't have any authority yet his words carry weight and meaning A prince doesn't actually have any power, but he carries himself with the confidence that he is backed by somebody with power. 
And so as a, a, a child who is living from affirmation has a deeply rooted sense of their identity. So a young man who is a prince and his dad is a king thinks not with what he has but what his father has and that's why he doesn't think in a scarcity mindset. He has authority, he doesn't really have any authority except what his father empowers to him. He, he doesn't live um, with uh, any sense of, um, of powerlessness because the confidence he operates in comes from the fact that his dad rules over the kingdom. Please put yourself as that prince because your father in heaven is, is uh, Jehovah a lot of things, but Jehovah Jireh is one of them, the Lord who provides. You don't have to have a scarcity mentality when you understand that the Lord God of heaven is your dad and he's the king over all the earth and can bring into your life whatever you need in a moment of time in Jesus' name. We worry about what we lack and he is saying, will you just believe me for what I already have that I can funnel into your life you have authority you have power you have confidence you have significance not because anyone on earth told you you did but because the Lord God of heaven put his hand on your life and says I want this one in my family and you are a child of the living God you are a prince princess of God and you are somebody to be reckoned with in other words for our natural dads we have to be careful how we communicate perspective to our children. And so what can happen because of our years of experience and our, our own school of hard knocks we could have gone through, there is something in every parent that wants to prevent their children from making the same mistakes we did. It's a passion. It's all of us. That's why we have such profound wisdom that is given to our children when they're not even asking for it. And, 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 the, and the unfortunate spiritual deception we can get into is we can try to get into a role of becoming the Holy Spirit for our children. And instead of being an empowerment, we become a nag. Instead of really affirming them, we become critical. Because we know that this decision they make is not going to have a good ending. So don't even make that one. Make this other one that I would re recommend you make. And do everything. if you do everything I tell you to do, your life's going to be great. <laughs> but dad, you've criticized your children long enough. Now it's time to give them affirmation. It's time to affirm them in their womanhood, in their masculinity, in their femininity, for them to fulfill the will of God. In John 14, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices us. Jesus said, have I been so long with you and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Some people say, I am nothing like my Father. Jesus' sense of identity was so strong, he said, I am exactly like my Father. Isn't it interesting that people with addiction issues, you know, and this, is, this touches people's lives in a very dramatic way and, and it can be very sad and challenging. Like if I'll pick one, not because I know anything about anybody, but we've just seen it occur where there may be an alcoholic issue in a family tree. And, and a son makes a decision, I will never ever be like my father. And they end up with an addiction, it may not be alcohol, but it's a different kind of one. And they work so hard not to be that, then they end up becoming that. Have you ever noticed that? And it's because you can't stop being like somebody else in the flesh alone. If you don't have the help of your heavenly father, you're not going to get free of whatever you got right now anyway. How many times, how many years has it been trying to break something in your life, an addiction of some kind or whatever? Well, you can't do it without the Lord. And so Jesus, he was so secure in who he was and the affirmation the father gave him, he said, I, I, I do all things that please the father. He wanted to please the father in all of his ways. Number two, it fosters the building of true confidence. Confidence is the natural response to having a deeply rooted sense of identity. 
And when your children experience your affirmation, it gives them the freedom to learn, take risks, to fail, to grow, and to succeed. Each of those come with the experience, the, the gaining of experience. By creating a safe environment for acquiring experience, you are fostering the building of their confidence. Furthermore, this kind of confidence is not a cheap confidence. It's not bravado, but a true confidence, one that has been hard-earned, one that has been, been chiseled because experience and, and, and affirmation, when, when a child has the room to grow, and they are not criticized for them taking a risk, but affirmed in that, they will learn through that and they will get stronger. Not to come back and, and the parents are all critical and uh, uh, yelling at them or upset about them because sometimes as parents, when kids go a different direction that we think is best, we, we can get ourselves uh, offended because we want our kids to do our predictables. <laughs> You know, uh, speaking of Andrew, <laughs> who did not do any of the above, of all of our three kids, he was the one that we, that we thought would not leave, that got, not go too far away from home. And he ended up going away the longest. Uh, he went to college in Texas. He came back and we said, son, uh, you're back. Do you want to stay with us? He said, look, I'm can't remember what age he was, you know, 30, 25, 27 years old, and I will not be living with my parents at that age. Totally fine with us, your will, your bill. I mean, hey, we're good, you know. But then he moved to Atlanta and worked for a finance company there and, and had a very challenging job, but he learned experience. And then eventually came home. But if he did what we wanted to do, if all of our kids did what we wanted to do, they would never have gone anywhere that they went. Uh, Emily went to Arizona, uh, Andrew went to Georgia, but the devil wasn't there, <laughs> and Anna went to Seattle. And one thing that we're humbled about, we released our kids to do the will of God, and now they all live in Raleigh. Because we prayed, Lord, don't let our kids do to us what we did to our parents, which was to get married and move. And for me, it was international. For Judy, it was out of state. We've never lived with our parents for a massive long amount of time after we got married, but pursued the will of God. The will of God is better than the will of man. Amen. And number three, it inspires purpose. For Jesus, his purpose in life was very clear. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was really focused on his particular purpose. But living from a place of affirmation inspires the, the, the purpose of a child's heart. Just as deeply rooted sense of identity begets confidence, confidence begets purpose. Obviously, purpose is the sense of heading somewhere, that you're going somewhere in life. It's being on mission. Its purpose propels you forward. It gives you clarity and focus. It gives you both something to strive for and makes all of the striving worth it. Yet I think one of the most defining questions we have to ask ourselves as a parent is this. Do I want my kids living for my affirmation or do I want them living from my affirmation? Do I want them living for my affirmation or do I want them living from my affirmation? Here's the indictment. When we try to get our kids to live for our affirmation only shows us the weakness that you already still have in your life. Your inability, parents, not just dads, but your apparent inability to release affirmation and identity on your children indicates that you don't have it for yourself. But when you can come to a point where you get your kids affirmed in such a way that they're not having to prove anything to dad, here's the sad part about humanity when there's been difficult parental relationships. A lot of kids spend the rest of their life Swinging at shadows, proving to someone that they either no longer live with or may not even be alive, that they can make it because they told me I would never make it. I'm going to show them. 
and they spend the rest of their life trying to get from a absent or even deceased father something that dad never had the capacity to give them because where they were and that's why our affirmation has to come from the Lord you may or you may not get it from your dad but if you don't get it from your dad then the devil's certainly not going to give it to you except he will affirm affirm you towards destruction he will not affirm you towards life and so your answer to that question lies at the very heart of, of, of our relationship with our kids. See, the greatest gift a dad could ever give is the freedom to live from his affirmation, not for his affirmation. You know, Jesus, as a son, received solid affirmation from his father. He needed it to protect him from the rejection that was waiting for him. You know, and, and rejection is a, is part of everybody's life. But I've changed my mindset about rejection. I always used to see rejection as a negative thing. And as a pastor, leading people, trust me, we've had our buckets worth flowing over with rejection. Of people who are with you and then suddenly not, and they, it's like, I, I, this goes through my mind when people say, pastor, we're behind you all the way. And then you turn around three weeks later and say, He is so far behind me, I can't even see him anymore. Uh, (laughs) But what I've learned about rejection, that sometimes rejection is protection. Don't have to resist every measure of rejection in your life. Sometimes God moves people out of your life to preserve what he's called you to do. Because not everybody in your life is wanting to move the same direction as you. They're going to tear you down more than build you up. It's not that you live suspicious, you just live aware. That, that the ebb and tide of life is that everyone has a, 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 an agenda, everyone has a thought, and God may not always put people with you that are going to move you the direction you need to go. And so it's said of Jesus in Isaiah that he was despised and what? And rejected. But how did he handle that rejection? He handled it because his father had said, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. And he says, I am living for something bigger than the acceptance of man. I've already got the acceptance and the affirmation of my dad. Dad is with me. And, and some of you are still, may still struggle with what dad said to you in the past and the things that you've gone through. Because there is enough rejection in our world without having to deal with it from your dad. But Jesus doesn't want you to live with emotional holes in your heart. You may have to just once again flat out forgive your dad. Uh, Judy and I were talking about this. You know, the Bible says, um, uh, the scripture says to, um, um, I looked over at Judy and she's not there. So I'm thinking, where'd she go? Uh, uh, I have totally lost my train of thought. I'll be right back. <laughs> Oh, you need to forgive your dad. Yeah, we were, we were talking about forgiveness and the scripture says, how often should we forgive someone? Seven times, perhaps? And what did the Lord say back? No. Isn't it interesting? You know that one. And some of you are checking off. Okay, any... F- 325 to go. So as we were talking about this, Judy said something very astute. She just, she is praying about it. And she just felt like the Lord told her that you need to forgive every time that offense comes back to you. You just got to forgive and forgive and forgive. The hardest scripture in the Bible to live, love those that hate you, bless those that curse you, pray for those that despitefully use you. You say, God is love. Yeah, but this is living right here. And when, when an offense comes back to you, you forgive them again. And he says, how can I forgive you your sins if you haven't forgiven those that sinned against you? You may need to accept God's love and acceptance as the only love and acceptance you will ever receive. You cannot be looking to people to give you what only can come truly from the Lord. You need to not live for affirmation. You need to live from it. There's incredible strength of knowing who you are. Who am I? You are his beloved son and daughter. And so well, you don't know what he's done and don't know what he said. We can't control any of that. All we can do is move forward and forgive and see the power of God move in our life. 
your earthly father may not have the capacity to give you all that you want or need in your life. You must depend on the Lord Jesus Christ because he alone will give you what you need. Amen. Let's stand together. Uh, but my ask of you as you stand is don't move around a whole lot and don't leave un unless it's really urgent. Um, because I just want to say this to you today. And I don't know how deep this touches your heart because I know I'm not just talking about fathers, I'm talking about everybody. Because all of us are children and like me, I had an absent father because of death. But I didn't have a deficient life because God brought significant men into my life. Plus, my heavenly father was always there with me. I had this moment uh, after Jude and I married and returned to Australia. I hadn't been to my father's grave. I you know, died when I was five. Uh, they didn't even have me go to the funeral. I was just too young. So I didn't go to his, his tombstone often, but when I did, all the letters had fallen off because they were little press-on letters and I was piecing them back together and trying to read what this inscription said and it said a scripture from the book of Philippians and it said to be with Christ is far better. And the more I pieced the letters together, the more I read it, the more the revelation of to be with Christ is not better. It's far better, amen? And I jumped up and I said, you turkey, Turkington. I was called Turkey all the way through school. And when I came to America, I thought everybody knew me. Yeah, Turkey? Yeah, oh, yeah, good day, mate. How are you? Yeah, he knows me, mate. And I realized they were actually making fun of me, but that's okay. I just said, you old Turkey. I said, you've been up, up there in heaven having all this fun time and enjoying yourself, and I've been down here with a broken heart. But in that moment, I realized how faithful my heavenly father had been to me in the journey of my life. And your heart may be broken because of a bro broken or a maybe less than perfect relationship with dad, but dad may be gone. He can't fix that for you, but our heavenly father can. Amen. So if, I, if the Lord was to speak to you today, I, I, I want to reflect for a moment a few words to you that would come from your heavenly father. I think it would go like this. He would say, I am so proud of you. And I love you. And I wish nothing but the best for you. I'm proud of you. I love you. I wish nothing but the best for you. What's your response to that today? If your thoughts of dad bring, bring either a fight or a flight emotion, then you may well need to forgive him. But even more, to receive from God what dad never had the capacity to give and that is identity and affirmation. Amen. Amen. Close your eyes for just a moment. He loves us Oh how He loves us Oh how He loves us Oh how He loves He loves us Oh how He loves us today we choose to receive your love to receive your identity your identification of us as your children Lord we struggle in the flesh with sin with words that shouldn't 
we shouldn't say, with behaviors we shouldn't do, with thoughts we shouldn't think. And we are so hard on ourselves because maybe we had a natural dad that was hard on us. Lord, we're not gonna project that on you, that you are just like our natural father or our stepfather or our godfather, but that you are our perfect father who knows our frame, who knows that we are flesh, knows our strengths and weaknesses, and yet you love us, you accept us, and you affirm us anyway. Today we receive your identity. Today we receive your affirmation. And Lord, I pray that we can now turn it, that we'll surrender trying to be the Holy Spirit in our children's lives, in our spouses' lives. That, that Lord, that we will come with words to encourage and to build up and to release our children to their next measure in the name of Jesus. And that, Lord, instead of struggling for affirmation, that we will live our life from a place of affirmation that builds confidence and strength and authority and gives us the sense of purpose that as we live our lives, we're living it with your thoughts in mind, that you are, we are pleasing to you and that we are worthy of your love and that you do think good thoughts about us. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord good thoughts to give you a hope and a future you are not against us if God be for us who can be against us you are you are not against you are for us Lord and forgive us for allowing religion to rob the joy of our relationship with you Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our parenting. Rejoy restore the joy of our wifery and our husbandry and our childrenry and all the places that you've got us, Lord. We thank you that we can live life to the fullest from the place where we are in you because of your redemptive work. And we give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. I'd like our prayer team to come this morning and as we finish, if you've never given your heart to Jesus and want to receive him as Lord and Savior today, we, we offer that to you today. Please just come forward in a moment. Just say, yeah, I, I need to get saved. I need to get my life right with Jesus. Or maybe there is something that the Lord has stimulated in your heart today that you want to receive prayer for. Feel free to do that. But I just wanted you to know I love you so much. Happy Father's Day to all about that. Did, was this an encouraging word for you today? Was it hopefully, hopefully helpful? Father, today in the name of Jesus, as we go, we go in the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, as we fellowship with dads today that they are celebrated and affirmed and, and let us not be triggered by the past. We give all that to you today. We forgive those who've hurt us and we accept your identification and your affirmation as, as your beloved children. Heal us. Make us strong as a people. Make us strong as a nation as we take our place to worship and follow you. And this week, Lord, is going to be a good week. You've got things in store for us. Let us hear clearly, and we will follow your lead in the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. God bless you.